Well, thank you, Men's Ensemble, for singing. Thanks, Dean, for leading us in worship. I appreciate that, Ardeth, for playing. It's a good day to be in the Lord's house. Have you ever heard a Memorial Day message on the Song of Solomon? (laughs) I haven't either. So today is not a Memorial Day message. But just to say that, what I have said before, I'm grateful for those who have sacrificed themselves for our nation, for my freedom. These men and women saw a need, and they saw something worth protecting, and they responded in a courageous way. As the saying goes... All gave some, and some gave their all. We should commemorate these people for what they have done and for the ideal that they push us towards. I'm grateful for that. Coincidentally, that is why we are studying Song of Solomon. Not because for the men and women who have died for our nation, but because of God and his ways. He has given us a standard, an ideal, that he is pushing us toward. And we are to commemorate that ideal. Just like tomorrow on Memorial Day, we're going to commemorate an ideal has been, that has been left for us. Today, we are commemorating that ideal. It is not just for us to sit back and clap at the ideal that we are studying today, but it's for us to join and live that ideal. Just like every Memorial Day, when we hear the taps and hear the gun salute and listen to the message, We're not just supposed to sit back and say, wow, I'm so glad those people did it for us. But we're supposed to feel stirring in our heart that I should do something too to stand up and protect my nation. A man and a woman coming together in marriage images God in a way that nothing else in society does. It's true. If you think about it, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. All right, I forgot. Kids, leave. (laughs) Thank you. They got the Memorial Day part, now they can go. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Man and woman are equally created in the, in the image of God. They're created as equals in his image. They're created as equals in the responsibility to carry out God's commands and purposes. Boy, this place looks a lot empty without the kids. But though they're equal in status... They are different in function. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 records, The Lord said, It's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. Before this, God gave man, Adam, the law. He said, Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the one law at that time. Just one. They couldn't keep it. But he gave the one law to Adam. Eve wasn't created yet. And Adam was charged of passing that law to Eve as a method of leadership. He created the woman to help in the leadership. There's a difference in function. We could talk about biological differences. We could talk about emotional differences. We can all agree on some point, no matter who you are, that men and women are different. Except if you're a member of Congress and you can't define what woman is. But we're not going there. Man and woman, completely different, were designed to come together as one. Genesis 2.24 says, Genesis 2.24, Genesis 2, there we go. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Man and woman, equal in status, equal in responsibility, different in function, designed to come together as one. It's interesting, this description, this word one, is the same description that is given to God in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all equal in status because they're all 100% God, all equal in responsibility because they're all 100% God, but they are different in function. They're different in how they complete their joint will. Equal in status, 
different in function, unified as one. Nothing separating them, nothing hidden. It's the Trinity. Marriage is designed by God to be a picture of God to all of creation so that everything that breathes might fall deeper and deeper in love with God by seeing the marriage that he created. But society decided to tear that marriage apart. Every single day, society tears marriage apart and says, oh, we can do it better. Oh, we know what is right. Oh, I just, you know, I want to follow my feelings and my desires. But deep down, it's a scheme to break the image of God so that creation cannot see the glory of God through what he has created. We're going through Song of Solomon for two purposes. We're going to, through it, to understand the text, and we're going through it to give a defense of marriage. Last week, we studied chapter one, and we discussed the first part of what I call the glory of sex. And if you were not here last week to listen, please go back, watch it, because it's going to build in a lot on what I'm talking about today. And then if you want to go back and listen to the introduction to Song of Solomon before Mother's Day, uh, that would be great too, because that helps as we keep the imagery going on. I discuss a lot of different stuff. Today, we're going to study chapter two and the second part of the glory of sex. But before we dive in, will you pray with me? Father, King of kings and Lord of lords, the great I am, the all-sufficient one, thank you that though you don't need us, you designed us and created us that we might give you glory. And even in our sinfulness, somehow you are glorified. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that you chose us before the foundation of the earth to worship you and glorify you. I'm thankful that you chose us to join in your amazing ministry and plan as you advance your kingdom throughout the world. Most of all, Lord, thank you that we get to have an intimate relationship with you, that we get to know you fully just as you know us, and we get to bask in your unconditional love, your covenant loyalty to us. Forgive us, Lord, how we take that for granted Forgive us how we turn from you day after day and say we want to go our own way and we want to follow our own desires and break your images. Lord, bring us back to you that we might stand and proclaim your truth, not just with our mouths, but with our lives. That the world might know that you are truly king and serving you is the best thing in the whole wide world. Lord, as I'm up here, I ask that I would decrease and that you would increase. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Thanks, Father. Amen. We're going to look at Song of Solomon chapter 2. As we read the passage, I want you to look at the character of the man, the lover, and the response of the woman, the beloved. Last week, as we walked through Song of Solomon chapter 1, I read a chunk and we kind of talked about that chunk, then I read another chunk, and we kind of talked about that chunk, we worked through it. This week, we're going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to come back through for some comments. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the young women. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall, and let his banner over me be love. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or waken love until it so desires. Listen, my beloved, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills, My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. My dove is in the clefts of the rock. 
in the hiding places on the mountainside. Show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. My beloved is mine and I am his. He browses among the lilies. Until the day breaks, the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hills. Ah, such a great chapter. Amazing poetry. Let's go back and fill in some of the blanks of what we're looking for and what is actually going on in this text, shall we? Last week, we discussed how the woman was insecure about her appearance. She says she was dark because she was working the fields all day and she couldn't take care of her beauty. And her lover heard her, met her where she was at emotionally and said, no, you're the most beautiful thing in the world to me and let me prove it and let me do what it will take to, for you to sh- feel the beauty that I see. And she responds to that now in the start of verse Chapter 2, verse 1, and she acknowledges the truth about her beauty. She says, yeah, it's true that I am like a flower. I'm beautiful, and I produce a fragrance. In Hebrew, fragrance means actions, a beautiful actions to all that are see and interact with her. He agrees that, yes, this is who you are, and he ups the statement. Not only is she a flower, but compared to her, all the other girls that are flocking around him because he's such a great quality guy, all the gals around are thorns compared to her and her beauty. She is the one that he dotes on. He will not turn to anyone else in lust for any other reason. She's the beloved. She is the beauty. No one else. And looking at him and how much he loves her and dotes on her, she feels secure. She feels protected in his strength and steadiness. So she describes him in verse 3, like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. She is the flower, tender on the ground. He is the apple tree, strong and protective, roots going deep into truth. The difference between the flower and the apple tree. The apple tree protects the tender shoot. She loves to sit under that protection because she knows it is strong and he will always do what is best for her. And what he does, his fruit is sweet to her, his actions, the things that come from his character. So what is the character of this lover, this man? He is a man who is protective. He is a man who is caring. He is a man who is rooted He is a man who looks after her needs, her cares, protecting her from storms, focusing on admiring her alone. We could talk about his steady pursuit of her, that he is constantly trying to prove his love and proclaim his love to her over and over and over again. We could talk about his kind, caring words, his public displays of love that go on later in the chapter, but we don't have time. It's amazing, all the character of the man that comes out in this chapter. It's like this to-do list, a a must-see list for all the ladies and say, do you know a guy you're supposed to fall in love with? This is who it is. Guys, do you know who you're supposed to be? This is who it is. All throughout this chapter, spelled out this great man of God who emulates Jesus Christ himself. We need to turn to the beloved and talk about her. What is the response? In the face of the man who performs his God-given role, the beloved has three responses to him. She has a verbal response. She doesn't keep her love hidden. She is constantly telling her friends, dude, this guy's a hunk. I'm so in love with him. Over and over and over he's saying that. She's bragging about him to everyone. The whole chapter with The exception of verse 2 is her talking about him, describing the man to her friends, saying, hey, this is what he said to me. I want you to know about it. It seems that these days, most women get together to crab about their husbands. But this woman doesn't want to do that. She wants to exalt him with her mouth, with her words. She wants to lift up the good character that she sees because she loves him so much. 
not only does she have a verbal response, but she has an emotional response. She's inside her house, and she sees him coming to her, and she sees the excitement in his eyes as he's coming just to spend some time with her. In verse 8, she describes him. Uh, he says, listen, my beloved, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. He says, this is the excitement that he wants to spend time with her. And lots of girls are like, why would he want to do that? But he does. And then he speaks from verse 10 to verse 15 is his words. And she is quoting her, his words back to her friends. The beauty of his words, the way he says, darling. The way he says, my beautiful one, inviting her to come outside and spend the day with her because he just can't stay away. Sure, he should be in the field planting, but today he doesn't want to. He wants to be with her to the point of saying, I want to be with you so much, let's get rid of all the things that distract us from our relationship. Song of Solomon 2.15, it's one of my verses that I go with premarital counseling couples. I have a lot of fun because I tell them to read it before we meet together and we come back together and I say, so what does this verse mean? And they look at me like, I got nothing. Verse 15, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. In Song of Solomon, lots of times a vineyard is a symbol for the relationship and the foxes are coming and tearing that relationship apart and the man says, get rid of everything that tears our relationship apart, that distracts us. Let's focus on us together because that's the most important thing. And she responds to him saying, let's protect our relationship. And she responds in verse 16 and says, my beloved is mine and I am his. It's an emotional response. That yes, I see all he's doing to value and prioritize my relationship. And she responds back, says, yes, I want this. I don't want anything else. My beloved is mine. I am his. He browses among the lilies. It's, he comes in excitement and quickness to come to be with her, and he stays in slowness, slowness like a young stag grazing around because he just wants to be with her. And she responds, just wanting to be with him. You can almost hear her gush through this. But not only does she respond verbally and emotionally, but she also responds sexually. God designed women to respond to emotional connection sexually. Guys and gals are different that way. We talked about it last week. Guys move from sexual connection to emotional connection normally. Women move from emotional connection to sexual connection um, normally. And the woman in Song of Solomon is no different. She sees the character in this man, his protection, his care, his pursuit, and she cannot wait for the wedding night. She describes him bringing her into the banquet hall uh, in verses uh, four and five, and everyone's around. He's proclaiming his love to her with banners, saying, this gal is amazing, I can't wait to marry him. And she says in verse five, strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. As I said, there are two words for love in Song of Solomon. One is for friendly, devoted, caring love. And the other is for erotic love. It could be described as lovemaking. And this word here is that word. For I'm faint with love, faint with dode. Now it's interesting, in Hebrew culture, raisins and apples were aphrodisiacs. They spoke of sexual things. She is love sick. Now, if you will indulge me in some translation stuff. The Hebrew in this is a lot more graphic than the English is. Literally translated, the Hebrew is lay me on raisins and spread me out over apples, for I am faint with erotic love. It is a graphic description of what she wants to happen when she sees this great hunk near her. Later, she proclaims her devotion and commitment to him at the end of chapter in the verse 17 and says, until the day breaks, this is after he has spent all this day with her and doted on her and says, you are worth everything to me. I don't want anyone else. Verse 17, she says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee, turn my beloved and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hills. Some of your translations might name a particular mountain range there. 
I believe the NASB does, a couple of the other ones, that mountain range is not in the translation. They're trying to make sense of the Hebrew that's going on. The rugged hills, the Hebrew, the, the word there is actually cloven hills. The word cloven speaks of cleavage. And this gazelle, this young stag, is bounding on the cleavage, what's going on. She yearns to be with him sexually is what she's saying. And she's telling her friends this. My guy is so great, I want to be with him. Because he's such a great character. Because he's fulfilling his God-given role. And because he's doting on her exclusively. But she understands that she cannot be with him yet. Even though she yearns to be with him sexually and she just can't hold it in. She can't be with him yet. And she turns to her friends in the middle of this. In verse 7, she says, Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse in or awaken love until so desires. Urging them to wait until the guy with character comes before giving out their heart, but also urging them to wait until marriage to enjoy the ec- ecstasies on physical intimacy and oneness. She says, I desire it. And God blesses that desire, but we're not to fulfill that desire until marriage, as we talked about last week. Until then, she's content in the face of this guy who has great character, who fills his God-given roles, who dotes on her exclusively. She's content merely with his embrace. In verse 6, says, his left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me, holds him. It's interesting that marital counseling people, professional marital counselors, will turn to Song of Solomon and they'll go through it with their couples and they'll have them act things out from it. And one of the most powerful things that couples who are in a hard state in their marriage they experience is acting out this verse 6. Because it's one thing to hug someone but it's another thing to hug it in such a way that the man's left arm is under the head and the right arm embraces her as she reclines in him. It is a very intimate embrace. And couples who just sit there for half an hour embrace in that way find so much of their emotional disconnection changed. There's a unity and oneness that they feel. This deep, intimate embrace that is not sexual, but promotes unity. So that is Song of Solomon chapter 2. The character of the lover and the response of the beloved based on that character and her desire to be with him. Love that desires to be with a spouse is a great thing. And love which desires to consummate that love in the most intimate way through sexual intercourse is a beautiful thing. That desire is good. It's a God-given desire. We're not to squish that desire down. We're to protect it. We're to keep it. And when we fulfill that sexual desire in the covenant in marriage, according to the ways of God, there is joy and sweet passion that is not found in any other experience of it. I've talked with people who have been sexually active before marriage and sexually active after marriage, and they say the sexually active after marriage is so much better than that before, because God designed it that way. There's a joy, there's a sweetness when we protect it for that. Unfortunately, we are human, and we so often take the gift of God and we twist it. Last week, we looked at God's design, and he designed sex to be the consummation of a man and a woman's love for each other, a consummation that would occur within the covenant of marriage. I appreciate what a guy by the name of James Hamilton wrote, and he wrote it so much better than I could have ever said it. He said, people who believe what the Bible teaches about sexuality are sometimes viewed as killjoys, as those who won't let others others have any fun. That's not it at all. We want people to have the most pleasure with the least regret. We want people to be more than beasts, more than dogs or donkeys. We want people to have more than physical trysts that cheapen, demean, and dehumanize. We want people to enjoy the most comprehensive interpersonal union of soul and body in the exclusive, permanent, monogamous, life-producing covenant of marriage. God's design is good. And we're not saying don't do what is pleasurable. We're saying do what God designed as pleasurable because everything else is cheap. Everything else dehumanizes. Everything else tears us apart. 
But if we protect what God is good and we say we're going to do this in the ways God has designed it, that is ultimate pleasure. That is ultimate joy. That is ultimate connection and intimacy. And God blesses it. God's design is so good. But unfortunately, we have perverted it. And today we're going to talk about three ways that we have perverted it. We've perverted it by performing it outside of marriage. Sex can be an expression of love, a form of close intimacy. Sex can be a release of raging passion, the result of wanting to feel really good. And both things are good. Both reasons to do it are good because sex is pleasurable. Because the twisting emotional, physical elements come together and bring us ecstasy at times. We want it because it is pleasurable. And God designed us to want it. He gave us this urging to want it in the rhythms of life. But so often, we look at this great gift that God has given, the pleasure that is at our fingertips, and we say, I want it now! And we're like this toddler with a donut right in front of him, saying, please, please give it to me, give it to me! There's a reason why people used to marry their kids, 13, 14 years old. Hormones are rushing through their system new feelings and desires that they don't know what to do with. And the parents were like, fine, just get married. I don't want to deal with it. Just go. Today, we've said, you know, kids aren't mature enough to make such life-altering decisions, so they shouldn't get married yet. Now, I'm not up here advocating marrying 13, 14, 15, I believe that kids should mature a bit, especially today. We're not, desi- we're not teaching kids to be mature, mature these days. So they can't handle marriage that young. It's true. But the thing is, too few families, when they say, hey, kid, you're not mature enough to get married, they don't give their kids tools to stay true to what God has called them to. They just say, don't get married! They don't tell kids, hey, we're not telling you to forego sex, but we're asking you to defer it in order to receive the pleasure that God has designed it to be and teach them the full extent of everything we talked about last week, of what God designed sex to be, and therefore we should follow him, and it'll be good. And these are the ways you can follow him in your singleness and glorify him in a way that no one who's married can. So pursue that and intimacy with him and all those things. Instead, we say, don't have sex, don't get married, deal with it. Now, I don't want to, sometimes, when we tell kids, wait to have sex, because God has designed it the most to be very pleasurable, and it's going to be awesome. And they come to their wedding night, and they haven't had sex until then, they've been good. And they get there, and they stand before their spouse, and they look at each other and like, what do we do? And they try it out and like, that wasn't really great. And they go through this kind of semi-depression because they exalted it up here and it was kind of like down here. And like, this is what I've been waiting for all this time? What gives? But the thing is, sex takes practice. It gets better. I'm going on this rabbit trail, horrible, over time. And as you work together with your spouse, the one you're committed to, to please each other, to glorify him as you come together, you practice, and it gets better and better and better. In fact, statistics show that those who have been married 30 years have better sex than those who have been married a week or a year or seven years or 20 years because it gets better as you truly love one another and seek to know each other. There was a pastor who uh, gave his congregation a challenge that he was going to say a word or a phrase and they were to say a song that went along with it. And so he said, grace. And they said, amazing grace. Awesome. Love. Love lifted me. And he looked at the congregation and said, Sex! And the congregation just looked at him. 
And an old lady in the back pew stands up and she starts singing Precious Memories. <laughs> right? It's great. What God has designed, the goodness and the sweetness of people coming together to worship him. And it's worth waiting for. It is worth waiting for. It's worth working at once we get there. The thing is, kids don't have this, the only struggle with sex outside of marriage. Even within marriage, temptations come to seek emotional connection with someone else who's not the spouse. And that emotional connection can then lead further into sexual connection. Either way, whether, whether it's got there or not, emotional connection and sexual c- connection, emotional affairs and sexual affairs are sin against God. We're to be devoted to our spouse and our spouse alone. When we have sex with someone, we are connected to them with our very soul. It's a connection that cannot be broken, and it wreaks havoc on our lives as we seek true connection with our committed spouse. Whether we have connected with someone before marriage or after marriage, it wreaks havoc. And the practice that we have before marriage of staying faithful to the call of God sets us up to remain faithful to the call of God later. So when we're single and we have these desires raging in us, saying, I want to be physically connected with someone. I want to have sex. And we practice saying no all this time. Then when we're married to someone and times get rough and the love dies and we start thinking all these thoughts and our eyes start going all these places, we can say, no, I'm gonna be faithful to my spouse and I'm gonna seek connection with my spouse and I know I can do it because God led me through this time. I'm faithful now so that I can have the practice of being faithful later. To stand up with the beloved and proclaim in Song of Solomon chapter two, the beloved is mine and I am his. There is no other in my life, whether it's before marriage and I'm staying faithful to the one I do not know, or within marriage I'm faithful, staying faithful to one I do know, my beloved is mine and I am his. Unfortunately today, good Christian boys and girls do not have to turn to premarital sex to fulfill their desires for intimacy and pleasure. They can turn to pornography and masturbation all that they want to. Two-thirds of men look at porn at least once a year. One third of women do that. That is a self-reported number. And statistics show that self-reported numbers are low. Very low. So if two thirds of men, that's a self-reported number, good statistics tell us, yeah, about 95, 98% of men look at porn at least once a year. One third of women, eh, that's probably about 50, 60% of women look at porn at least once a year. Common Sense Media released a study and said, uh, the report is called Teens and Pornography, and they found that 73% of teen respondents aged 13 to 17 have watched pornography online, and more than half, 54%, reported first seeing pornography by the time they reached the age of 13, 15% before they turned 11. And online pornography is shaping their views about sex and sexual relations as nearly half 45% of teen respondents said that they felt online pornography gives helpful information about sex. And that is a tragedy. Because every time someone looks at pornography, they are seeking intimacy with that image, that video, and that book. And if they masturbate to that sense of intimacy, they're training their mind that intimacy comes from that thing and not from a real person. And they're going to desire that thing more and more and more to the point that a real person is not enough for them. And unfortunately, most of the teen boys in today's high school have reached that point. Real people are broken. Real people don't meet expectations. Real people require give as well as a take. But pornography, that's easy. It meets expectations, and I can just take I can take. And I've seen marriage after marriage suffer for decades because of the sinful choices of a boy or a girl in junior high. 
much less the sinful choices of a boy or a girl in their 40s or 50s. God designed sex to occur between a man and woman in a marriage relationship. And if that context of sex in a marriage relationship is removed, there is pain beyond imagination. What did the lover say in Song of Solomon, ver Song of Solomon verse 2? Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the young women. The world, whether it is in person or on the screen, whether we know our spouse or not, the world is supposed to be a thorn compared to our spouse or our future spouse. We're saying this is the most beautiful thing to me and I don't want anything to ruin the relationship I have with my beloved. Nothing. And I'm going to run from it. The last perversion I have time to talk about is the perversion of homosexuality. The world will say, shouldn't people who love each other be able to be with each other? And the simple answer is no. When we loosen the morality of God, we open the floodgates of whores. It's interesting, if I, I have a hat, I, I have, mm -hmm. I have uh, 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 something that I really enjoy that a lot of people don't. I enjoy listening to court decisions. I do. I really do. People think it's boring, but those arguments are amazing. And then when the judges come out and read their manuscripts in that monotone, I just eat it up. I know. But you can track these court decisions. And when a certain court decision came about, that allowed homosexual relationships across the board, soon after that, certain small districts around the United States began allowing polyamory, which is a nice name for polygamy. Other districts started to think about loosening laws on pedophilia, and you can track it. Because once you say, God's morality is not correct here. Well, then God's morality must not be good here. And God's morality should not be good here. So when someone comes to me and says, don't you think someone who loves each other should be with each other? I look at them and say, no. Because there are some people who love kids and they shouldn't be with them. And we got to follow God's morality somewhere and I recommend following it where he said to follow it. God designed sex to be within marriage of a man and woman. There is joy and pleasure in that committed union that is not found in any other system, including homosexuality. The Bible clearly writes in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust because they turned from him and said, we don't want to follow you, God. He gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were aflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. There are many reasons why someone enters a homosexual relationship. And I'm not here to give discourse on why that happens. That is a discussion for another day. My heart goes out to so many people who have turned these relation, to these relationships to feel what is lacking in their life or to heal from trauma that happened, things that should never happen to them, and a lack of love that should never be there. And my heart goes out to them. But the simple statement is that homosexual relationships will not provide what those people are looking for. God says, love is found in me, intimacy is found in me, healing is found in me, and if you look for it in anything else, you're not going to find it. It's not going to happen. Pornography will not do it. Sex outside of marriage will not do it. Homosexuality will not do it. True joy, true intimacy, true pleasure only comes through the institution that God designed as a reflection of himself marriage, and whenever we take a baseball back to that image and break it, true joy, 
true intimacy, true pleasure is lost. If we look for those things in anything else, we will not find them. We will be unsatisfied and will create chaos, chaos and pain in our life. And I've talked with homosexuals after homosexuals who've experienced that chaos and pain and finally turned to Jesus and found true joy, true intimacy, and true pleasure that they've been seeking all their life. It's him, him alone and his plan. If you look at yourself and your life and you have struggled with or are struggling with any of these perversions of the blessings of God, whether it's sex outside of marriage or pornography, homosexuality, or any of the other plethora of twistings that we of humanity have done for the gift of God, let me know. Let someone else know. Don't struggle with it yourself. Turn to someone else where you can find freedom in God's amazing redemption of your story. There is always grace. We don't have to sit back and say, woe is me, I'm doomed, there's no hope. No, God is able to bring purity back to our life. He's able to redeem the brokenness of our stories as he is in mine, as he is in so many else's, as we turn to him and say, God, I need your help. And we turn to the church of God and say, I need your help. And we stand shoulder to shoulder to help us, to turn us back to him, that he can rework our heart and make it clean again. There is hope in the grace of God. And I am so grateful for that hope and that love. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the hope that you give. Thank you for the amazing gift of sexuality and that we can love you and serve you and worship you through it. Forgive us of how we have twisted it so many ways. Father, I pray that you would bring us back to your truth, that we would be a church who lifts up your morality and your standard and calls people to live it, not because we're legalistic, Lord, but because we know the blessings that come from following you. May we stand up in a world that is dark and morally decaying and declare your truth beyond a shadow of a doubt. Thanks, Father.